Hi, everyone. So welcome to the final session today, which, as Denzel mentioned, is on teaching Chinese immigration in the 19th century. Let me bring my slides up. So our goal here at the Public Education Institute is to educate Americans about the contributions of immigrants. And one way we do this is by creating educational resources for educators like you. We have lesson plans, a mini curricula, blog posts, and also videos. The resources are all free and they're easily available online at our website on Share My Lesson, which is a website of teaching resources hosted by the AFT, and also we have them on YouTube. So we'll give you links to all of this so you can find them. Now we've created a few resources that I wanted to highlight because they're particularly of interest to middle and high school educators um, and social studies teachers. Um, Denzel just mentioned our mini curriculum for the graphic novel, Welcome to the New World. We also have a curricular resource about teaching immigration and the American Revolution. And we have a very new curricular resource about teaching Chinese immigration in the 19th century, which is the topic of today's workshop. So what we're going to do today, it's going to be very interactive. Um, we're going to start by giving you a brief overview of the resource. Um, then my colleague Jay is going to give a short presentation about the Chinese Exclusion Act and specifically the historical context. Then we're going to do an activity, and this is one that you could do with your own students. And then finally, we'll finish with a discussion and a question and answer. Now, most of the activities we're going to do today are drawn from the lesson plans directly. So our aim is for you to leave this workshop with a more nuanced understanding of the topic, along with some ideas about how you could teach it to your students. But before going any further, we wanted to start with a poll. We're interested in learning who here has taught about this topic before. So have you taught about Chinese immigration in the 19th century? Let's see, so it looks like a few of you here have, but most of you have not. Um, so this should give you some ideas, even if you are not a social studies educator, it's really a fascinating topic. So we think that, well, there's something for everyone here. Now with all of our own resources for teachers, we try to make them as um, accessible as possible. So we have always given introduction to the topic. We have a few lesson plans and also some sort of supplemental resource. Um, in this case, we have one lesson plan about building the transcontinental railroad and another one which examines legal battles over Chinese immigration during this time. Uh, the lesson plans all have educator notes, objectives, guiding questions, material lists and activities. And of course, they're aligned to the common core standards. Um, we also have worksheets and then some sort of supplemental um, activity or guide. So what we're gonna do now oops, is start with an opening activity. So what we'd like you to do is look at the image here and type in the chat box, what do you notice? Or what questions do you have? And so the title of this one is A Street in Chinatown and it was created sometime between 1898 and 1905. Uh, okay, so I see people are commenting hand tinted photography. Why is it so empty? A lot of people are noticing the long hairstyle. Where is this? And now how about this one? Let's do the same activity. The title for this one is which color is to be tabooed next. It was created in 1882 and it looks like it appeared in Harper's Weekly. Um, it may be difficult to read what it says, but it says on the top, the new declaration of independence with independence in quotes. And then it says, for 20 years, no more Chinese laborers shall come to the United States and no court shall admit Chinese to citizenship. Underneath in the caption, it says, Brits to Pat, if the Yankee Congress can keep the yellow man out, what is to hinder them from calling us green and keeping us out too? So when you look at this, what do you notice and what sort of questions does it bring up for you? So people are noticing framing the public opinion. What does he mean by green? What seems new is not new, the racism. I see some people have noticed that this is referring to the Exclusion Act, which is what we're going to be talking about later. So as you can see, uh, what we recommend you do with students is to bring this up, to give them an introduction to the activity to the topic that we're going to be talking about. 
And this, of course, introduces what we're going to be talking about today, which is more about the Exclusion Act. Um, but now we have another activity that we'd like to do to activate your prior knowledge. Um, and it's called, what it is, is creating a group schema map in Padlet. Now, a schema map is a way for students to connect their prior knowledge to the lesson, and it's also a way for them to organize their learning. It's similar in some ways to a KWL chart, for those of you that use that with your students. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a link uh, in the chat box to the Padlet, which we've all used before. Um, so I don't need to explain how to use it, but you can double click on the Padlet to make a post, or you could click on the icon and the posts are all anonymous. But what we want you to do now, before we really get into the content of what we're talking about today, is to just give you a minute to post something that you already know about Chinese immigration in the 19th century, or some questions that you have about that time period. Um, and we're going to be coming back and filling out this schema map as we go along the lesson. So this is just the initial, the initial moment. So I can see that there is the, um, the link is there. Okay, so now that you've all activated your prior knowledge a little bit and you're primed and ready to learn more about this topic, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague Jay to give the historical context. Um, and then after his presentation, we're going to return to this schema map to add some new information, um, perhaps expand on posts um, or revise the posts as needed. So keep this in mind uh, as you're listening to Jay's presentation. All right, thanks very much, Jay. Hi everyone, my name is Jay. I'm the new research associate at the Immigration Learning Center Public Ed Education Institute. And uh, it is my pleasure to share this presentation with you today. I was um, in a U of, an AP US history class when I first encountered the Chinese Exclusion Act. Being an immigrant from East Asia myself, I was very shocked to find out that Chinese people had been immigrating to the United States as early as the 18th century. And during this class, I don't remember going very much into the details of the Chinese exclusion, other than that the act had led to the exclusion of Chinese immigration. But considering that the Chinese exclusion act has had so many lessons for how immigration policies um, have shaped since, I think it's important to understand the historical contexts in which uh, the act was brought up. So to present a more accurate picture of why and how this country's immigration policies have poorly justified and unfair facets to this day. The ramifications of the Chinese Exclusion Act are huge and it is still felt throughout different communities um, and classrooms. And I hope that the short presentation I'm going to share with you um, will remind you that the policies such as the Chinese Exclusion Act do not develop in a vacuum. Um, there is a list of other issues that made the conditions ripe for such discrimination to have taken place so formally. So. And you can feel free to write um, what you think are to be the dominant narrative of what Chinese, um, the dominant narrative of Chinese exclusion, but the way it has been conditioned for, for me has always been that um, Chinese exclusion happened as a result of the entire country being racist, um, that racism single-handedly manifested into policy. While that is not entirely untrue, there are other factors and subtleties to consider. Um, among many, some critical factors that paint a fuller picture as to how and why Chinese exclusion came at this time and in the way it did are international factors, domestic factors, and domestic econo economy factor. So let's begin with the um, international factor. What I mean by international factor here are the events and conditions outside of the United States that made it possible for the US government to ultimately enact what we know today as the Chinese Exclusion Act. The big thing to remember here is that the Qing Empire at the time was severely damaged from a series of wars and civil unrest that the entire country was collapsing instead of being able to reconstruct. And consider this. One can challenge the conventional notion of who the Chinese immigrants were uh, or during the time of the gold rush and exclusion. And contrary to the popular belief that Chinese immigrants at the time were economic migrants, um, the vast majority of them were folks fleeing the devastation back home. In other words, refugees. 
Our founding fathers and the pilgrims would have been regarded as refugees today. And the juxtaposition of the sheer differences in the ways in which different groups were treated despite coming to this country for the same reasons is shockingly different. It was during this time that the Berlin Game Treaty was signed and this treaty, which was meant to establish a fair and equal most favored nation MFN status for the participating parties, ultimately became an unequal treaty at the US to, as the US took advantage of the waning powers of the Qing Dynasty and made multiple amendments to it. One of those amendments was the cancellation of the agreement of the agreement to allow freedom of movement and immigration between the two countries. So let's move on to discussing some political factors within the United States. The decades leading up to the Chinese Exclusion Act um, were known at, was known as the Long Depression of the 1870s. When we talk about the Depression, though, we're not necessarily known, uh, we don't refer to it refer to the periods of 1870s, but this was the original depression. And during this time, unemployment levels were so high and it was um, and what was known to be the ironclad businesses failed in masses. About 18,000 businesses went bankrupt, including 89 railroads, 10 states, and hundreds of banks across um, the nation. The poor economic conditions inevitably led further social divides and immigrants were often targeted to be blamed for one's job, job losses. And having been hard, particularly, particularly hard with the economic hardship, California was also the home of the majority of Chinese immigrants who came and settled in today's Bay Area. And needless to say, Chinese immigrants became targets of aggression, violence, and blamed for agitated laborers who began to argue to limit Chinese immigration to the US to prevent them from, quote unquote, stealing our jobs. So how did a local California issue become so nationalized? It makes sense when looking at the presidential elections between 1876 and 1896. These races were razor thin. California had just gained statehood in 1850 and had enough electoral votes for political parties to care a lot about. In two of the five elect presidential elections, the winners of the electoral college and the winners of the popular votes were very different. And one of the other elections where the winner of the electoral college and the popular vote was the same, the winner of the popular vote won in the entire country by a margin of 10,000 votes. For example, let's look at the 1876 presidential election where President Hayes won by one electoral vote. Both parties had to think of what they needed to do to pander to those six electoral votes in California and other West Coast states. And as a result, many issues that were regional specific became so nationalized to attract votes from the West. And you can find these images if you search for them on Google and go to Wikipedia. Moving on, um, another important issue, last but not least, um, a little bit on the economic conditions of the US at the time. Now recall from five minutes ago that the US in the 1880s is the beginning is in the beginning stages of recovering from a recession. US businesses have learned from the last decade or so that the Chinese immigrants are cheaper and less likely to throw a fit as in unionize or go on strikes. So there is this bizarre situation going on where the laborers don't want Chinese labor to mix with the domestic labor but there is a push from the businesses to want to keep labor costs very low. And the same logic applies to the labor complexities stemming from the Civil War. And surely we learn of the sudden labor surpluses post emancipation, but to many businesses operating in states where there is a lack of former slave population and businesses that have experienced working with the Chinese, they prefer to keep cost of labor low and cheap. Therefore, preferring Chinese labor over others. And I hope this, remi th this reminder that there are more complexities around Chinese Exclusion Act beyond mere racism can help you better prepare your teachings in classrooms, allowing students to critically assess the events and periods of history more critically and helping them understand the different nuances of such multifaceted materials such as 
uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act. There are so many different factors, um, even to the Chinese Exclusion Act, beyond the international factors, the domestic labor factor, domestic ec economic factors that we've discussed today. And again, this wasn't supposed to um, serve as a lecture per se, but just as a reminder that there are these subtleties surrounding these topics. Um, here are great resources that I've pulled. Um, I pull a lot of my information from. Um, notice that the dates in which these books have been published, um, some of these date back as early as 2003, but so many of these great resources have been overlooked in the last century that um, I feel like now is a really good time for educators to look back into what had been published by, um, by, by teachers and educators of, uh, of color um, and who have those who those who have focused on these issues. So, um, and again, these resources are not limited to these four books, but um, my personal favorites are um, listed here. And we'll be posting this slideshow with the resources on our website um, after our webinar. So keep that, keep that in mind. Do we have any questions or very quick comments before we move on to the next um, activity? While you're all thinking about that, um, our next activity will be to go back to the, um, the schema map that we were just looking at. Now, uh, let's see. There's a really great feature on Padlet. Um, and so what you can do is if you, after you create your post, if you hover over it with your mouse, you'll see these three dots that come up. And that will bring up a menu that will allow you to connect your post to another one. So for example, if right now you'd like to expand on one of your previous posts or maybe revise it, you could connect those two together visually. So there are so many of us um, and there are a lot of posts, but if you're working with a smaller group of kids in a class, um, this is a great way for the, uh, the new knowledge to be organized together in a very visual way. So we'd like you to take a very quick minute um, and think about what you just heard from Jay and was there anything um, that you learned or maybe something that you were reminded of um, or something that you would, um, some new information, something that you wanted to expand on. So if you could just take a minute to go back to your schema map. So I'm seeing people adding about the presidential elections and the electoral college, something that is still in discussion today. Um, questions about where the Chinese immigrants migrated to, talking about the rail, railroads. Okay, and you're gonna have time to come back to this as well, but for now we're gonna move on to our next activity, which is a jigsaw activity. Okay, so what we do is we recommend for this next exercise to do a jigsaw. Now, very briefly, in case you don't know about a jigsaw, this is how it works. Um, you divide your students into home groups. So for this activity, it would be about five students per group. You give the assignment. So for us, it would be a graphic organizer that asks each group to research five rulings or laws. And then the students assign themselves to one ruling or law each to really become an expert on. At that point, the students rearrange into expert groups. So for example, everyone who's researching the PAGE Act would work together. After they've done their research, they return back to their home group and they teach the other group members about their ruling or law. They also get to learn from their peers about the other rulings and laws that they hadn't researched. Now, there really are a number of great benefits to using a jigsaw. Um, for one, it's a cooperative learning structure, so students work together for a common goal. Um, they're directly engaged with the material, which fosters deeper learning than just having the material presented to them. They also get to practice self-teaching and peer teaching. Um, and also, each student becomes an expert in one facet of the project, which allows them to contribute meaningfully to the group discussion. Um, and finally, it also really encourages kiddos to see everyone's contribution as valuable. Uh, now, in the interest of time, we're actually going to skip the beginning parts of this jigsaw and we're going to skip straight to number three, um, which is researching the rulings and laws in expert groups. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be spending the next few minutes to really zoom in on some very important laws and rulings at this time. Um, there's People v. Hall, the Act to Prohibit the Coolie Trade, the Page Act, and Inri Ayup. 
So what we've done is we've created different padlets for each ruling or law, and they look similar to this one that I'm showing on the screen. Um, oops. On the top, you'll see links to some primary source texts and summaries. You're also welcome to quickly Google search and do your own research. Um, and we'd like you to respond to these following prompts. So how did this law or ruling discriminate against the Chinese immigrants? Was the justification, what was the justification or stated reason for this law or ruling? Um, try to find a relevant direct quote. And then when was this law or ruling repealed or replaced? Now you can also comment onto other people's posts. There's an option to heart them if you think someone put something that was especially useful or relevant. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put links to four different padlets, one for each ruling or law in the chat box. Um, you can choose one, maybe one that you don't know so much about, one that sounds interesting to you. And we're just gonna give you about four to five minutes to do your very brief cursory research on it. Um, at that point, if we were in the class, you would have to go back and then after doing extensive research and teach your, your other students about it. Uh, but in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back as a group and look at, look at them all together. So what we'd like you to do is, I believe that the links are now in the chat. Choose one of the padlets um, and then do your best just in a very few minutes to pretend that you are a student and see how much you can research about the uh, ruling or law that you've chosen. And what's really great about doing this sort of activity is that students get a chance to become an expert. So if someone maybe feels a little bit shyer about contributing, they have the um, chance first to talk with the other people in their expert group to really be, gain confidence. And then when they go back to their home group, they can share as a meaningful con contributor to their group. I just want to walk through and give you little pointers as to what kind of um, facts that we should remember and we could remember um, about these four particular cases. So let's start with the People v. Hall. This was a famous 1854 case that happened in the California Supreme Court. Now, uh, note that the, Cal the state of California had just gained statehood in 1850. So um, for it's Supreme Court to hear a case about Chinese um, uh, about about Chinese people um, only four years after um, that territory had gained statehood. Um, you can kind of tell that um, the issues surrounding Chinese labor in the state of California had already become a big issue as early as um, the 1850s. Um, in retrospect, uh, if you think about that in, in, in different um, it just it sort of goes to show that um, Chinese laborers were there as early as the statehood, um, as as early as the, the state of California gaining statehood. So um, in People v. Hall, the California Supreme Court ruled that the testimony of a Chinese man who witnessed a murder by a white man was inadmissible, denying their right to testify in courts against whites. Um, this case ruling speaks to how the courts or the United States um, at large understood race and how culturally reinforcing whiteness was. And ultimately, um, as a result of People v. Hall, um, it categorized Chinese people alongside Native Americans and African Americans as lacking qualification and status to testify against white Americans in courts. So you start to see um, this social hierarchy form and it being legitimized and institutionalized in courts. And the facts to remember um, about People v. Hall is that court opinion reads that the Chinese were, quote, a race of people whom nature has marked as inferior and who are incapable of progress or intellectual development beyond a certain point, end quote. So that was direct quote taken from the court ruling. And you can see how the wordings were used to articulate um, the justification of institutionalizing social hierarchies based on race as early as the 1850s. Moving on to the act to prohibit the coolie trade as known as the Anti-Coolie Act of 1862. Um, the Anti-Coolie Act refers to two laws of the same names. And I think some people who were working on this um, on Padlet uh, had noticed that. 
um, two laws, one national and one California. The national one passed on February 19th, 1862, whereas the one in California passed on April 26th, 1862. Just two months after, um, apart from each other, they essentially are the same bill, um, though the one in California is better known to have been harsher and more targeted towards Chinese. Coolies here refer to unskilled Chinese laborers, um, and it became an ethnic slur during the railroad expansions. And this law passed after Californian laborers have already experienced Chinese laborers competing with the white laborers. And as many of you have noted, it taxed all Chinese immigrant workers who were from the quote, Mongolian race, $2.50 to work permit for fee um, per month. There were, um, the National Anti-Cooley Act was passed into law on February 19th. Um, and um, the national one was an attempt made by then Republicans seeking to prevent Southern plantation owners from um, replacing their enslaved African-American laborers with unfree contract or coolie laborers from China. Um, Southern plantation owners, as they accurately predicted um, the demise of slavery, had begun the process of recruiting Chinese laborers to replace slaves. Although this law passed, it was not actively being enforced because it was almost impossible to systematically identify coolies in the southern parts of the United States. Um, so those are some distinctions that you should be able to make um, when teaching about the, um, the anti-coolie acts of the 1862. Uh, moving on very quickly on the Page Act. Page Act is so well known uh, almost as almost as well known as the Chinese Exclusion Act. So I don't feel the need to go into that much details about it, but it was one of the very first immigration laws in the history of the United States that prohibited the entry of Chinese women. Um, I think on our, on our main padlet, I saw a question that asked um, how were I mean, most immigrants from China were men? And you're absolutely right. And that's as a result of, a, um, of this country having acts and laws like the Pot and Page Act. The bill's sponsor was Horace F. Page, a California rep uh, a state senator from California, um, who was a Republican at the time, who sought to put an end to the dangers of cheap Chinese labor and immoral Chinese women. And technically, it barred immigrants deemed undesirable from entry, which included forced laborers, prostitutes, and convicts of the countries where they were coming from. And it imposed a fine up to $2,000 in jail time of one year to violators. There were an overwhelming number of inspections to prevent Chinese women from entering the US, um, including pre-boarding investigations, onboard investigations, and several rounds of entry examinations and interviews. And the enforcement of the Page Act essentially resulted in a complete exclusion of Chinese women from the United States. Um, not only this act sexualized Chinese women, but it also um, formally stated that all Chinese women who were coming to the United States were basically prostitutes. So you can see what kind, how Chinese women and women in general were characterized back then as, in, in the 1878. So these are different nuances that we we often overlook, and a lot of the languages that are that have been used formerly in these acts are still used today in the most contemporary modern immigration laws. So keep that in mind. Um, so some facts to remember about the Page Act is that it was so successful in preventing Chinese women from immigration that it consequently kept the ratio of female to male so low that the, um, the law paradoxically encouraged the very vice it purported to fight prostitution. And sex balance was restored only between 1964 and 1952. Lastly, um, in the matter of IUP, um, the matter of IUP was a landmark court case from 1878 the case heard and decided in the U.S. Circuit Court for the District of Columbia or District of California, what is known today as the uh, Ninth Circuit Court. It could be explored. Um, it this case explored the concept of whiteness again in the American legal history and institutions, and it demonstrated that racism and discrimination of Asian immigrants in the 19th century. The court decided that residents of Asian descent were ineligible for naturalization because they were not white. The Chinese plaintiff, Ayup, attempted to argue that Chinese people were white, but the court dismissed its contention using the popular idea of race, invoking pseudoscience as evidence to support the idea of Orientals were not white. 
uh, the court emphasized that the lack of qualities of Orientals to the to be able to fully participate in the political culture and the governments of the United States. Some facts to remember about this particular um, case is that even non-citizen non-citizen Chinese immigrants were able to petition for their case legally. So the idea of um, everyone is equally subjected to law was there, but the legal treatment of those people who were bringing, bringing their cases to court were absolutely not at all um, on equal terms. And um, this was one of the very first cases that challenged the nationalization of law of 1802 using the notion of race and whiteness and further institutionalized um, the concept of whiteness into the institution, um, into our public institutions. And um, it confined them to race, ethnicity, and nationality. Back to you, Ariana. Thanks very much, Jay. So now I'd like you all to imagine that you are the students. You have just finished teaching about the ruling that you researched and you've learned from your other students. So you've now filled out your graphic organizer. At this point, we recommended everyone comes together as a whole group for a discussion. Um, which is what we will now be doing next. Um, we offered a whole lot of different prompts in the lesson plans from things like what um, commonalities or similarities do you notice among these different rulings and laws? We also included the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, what is something that surprised you? But what Jay and I thought that we would do today is we would ask you to focus a little bit more um, on how the law is used in history and present day to keep power structures in place. And what does it take to overcome this? So we'd like you to try to start making some connections between what was happening then in the legal system and uh, what is going on these days. So if you could take a few minutes in the chat to think about this prompt. Um, and also, please, if you have any other questions that come up, um, you can add them here as well. Or if there are any commonalities that you've noticed or anything that surprised you, we, of course, are interested in hearing that as well. So let's see, I see that some people have learned some new things they're going to reflect on. Was there anything that surprised you in what you've learned from Jay? Let's see, Sheila says, I believe one of the issues was or is misinformation presented in the media, which of course we've all heard a lot about recently is ways to teach about media literacy. Um, Lisa says the extent to which the ruling excludes people is there anything you would add, Jay, about um, if teachers are thinking about how they can connect this to everyday life for their students? What are maybe some things that teachers would want to think about, perhaps issues to bring up? I think it's really important to um, make that connection of what happened in the past, um, the past that we've, we conceive to be so far in distance but there's so many similarities that are happening as accurately being pointed out by everyone here. There, there's so many similarities that are happening today and um, being able to connect those dots um, will certainly be able to um, um, help your students understand that history isn't necessarily learning about uh, one particular um, picture in time. It's, it, it's the continuation. It's the process in which we understand how things happen. And I see here, um, we've had some people connect this to the DREAM Act, um, which is another current issue. Let's see, Philip writes that he learned that the language used in the Supreme Court decision was much more harsh and out of touch with science than he could have imagined. Um, let's see, Karen notices the injustices that have been done in the past and that it's very similar to current events, which is of course one of our main goals from this is to show students the connections between the past and present day to examine how people, society, laws, um, how that was addressed in the past and see the similarities and also differences with how things are going today so that students can then hopefully um, feel empowered and take actions themselves. Uh, we have just a few more minutes, so we'd like you to return. Oh, super, and we have Kuni here has shared, shared a visual aid that she used uh, and a jam board. Um, and so with that, we'd also like you to take one more time to go back to our schema map and just take another minute to reflect on after hearing about these specific laws and rulings, is there anything else that you would add to the schema map if you wanted to sort of organize your thoughts 
Um, is there something you'd like to add, something that makes you think of, maybe something that you would be inspired to learn more about going forward? Um, and I see here, right, Natalie writes, makes me think about immigration bans of recent years and how ethnic groups are targeted and labeled in the Muslim ban. Let's see, so I notice in the schema map that people are noticing the blatant unequal treatment Chinese built the railroad, the push and the pull factors, which I think is one of the major points that Jay was bringing up. Are there any other questions for us or comments about using this? The jigsaw is a great way to, to bring it into the classroom. So we also have, as I mentioned before, in addition to this one, we have a great resource about uh, immigration and the American Revolution. Um, so we've aligned it to the Massachusetts frameworks for social studies, but I think this is, these are topics that are really everywhere across the US. Um, and so we hope that you'll find these very useful. We're going to be creating more going forward. Um, and so please also feel free to drop us a line and let us know what sort of topics would be of most interest to you um, so that we can create the best resources for you to help with your teaching. And so with that, we'd like to thank you all very much for coming and we hope you enjoy our resources.